to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch buck? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new podcast for you. So today I have on Ike and Guy Eastman. Uh, so they're part of the Eastman's family, owners of Eastman's, uh, and, and just a couple of the most knowledgeable guys I know. Uh, so my expertise definitely lies in tactics and strategy, and and theirs does too. They know a ton about tactics and strategy, but they're also really good at explaining our position as hunters. Uh, so I wanted to have them on today. I wanted to talk about trophy hunting. Trophy hunting gets represented in such a negative light in our media, and, and it's used against us as hunters. And, and so I wanted to get them on as they just make great points at how trophy hunting is conservation and, and, and what we're doing as hunters and how to stick up uh, for our name and not not get bullied around and pushed around and be able to uh, explain and articulate our points to non-hunters. Uh, so I really enjoyed the conversation. Both Guy and Ike are fired up this morning, and so it, it, it made for a really fun conversation for me, and I know I had some great takeaways from it. I really enjoyed it. I think you guys are going to enjoy it too. I just want to thank our sponsors for today's show, Sportsman's Warehouse. Sportsman's Warehouse has multiple in-store locations, and they carry all the top brands. And it's so advantageous to be able to go in in person and try on those boots and look at the fabric and test the fit and look through the optics, hold up that rifle, shoot that bow. Uh, and, and having those in-store locations, you can do that. And, and they also have a knowledgeable staff that can help you make the right decisions, uh, help you find the right gear. And having this, these in-store locations, you can stop on your way to your hunt if you forget an item, if you forget a, a sleeping pad or a sleeping bag, or uh, if you need dehydrated meals, or like I always like to stop and get my tags there at Sportsman's Warehouse, and I always find something that's going to help me on the hunt. Uh, they, they have all the best gear. Uh, they're a great company, so if you're in the market for anything new, make sure to check out Sportsman's Warehouse. I also want to thank Savage Rifles. Uh, Savage builds some of the most accurate rifles, uh, outside-the-box accuracy, uh, just great shooting guns. And Eastman's has been using this brand for years. Uh, we believe in them. Uh, they've harvested most multiple animals for us. Uh, I've got a new one built up, a 6.5 Creedmoor, and I just love like their features. Like the the 110 Ultralight is an amazing rifle. Uh, they have the Accu stock where you can adjust the comb height or adjust the length of pull, so you can make that rifle fit you perfectly. They also have the Accu trigger, which you can adjust from 1.5 pounds to 4 pounds yourself. You don't need to take it to a gunsmith. Uh, so Savage is just producing great, accurate rifles. Uh, if you're in the market, make sure to check them out. And thanks to Savage Arms for their support of the podcast. Over there at Eastman's, uh, we've got some great Beyond the Grids hitting the uh, hitting the internet here. So um, Dan Picard has been producing some great ones, uh, some great elk videos. Uh, I know I've got a really good High Country Mule Deer one coming out that I'm excited to release to you guys, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, you can just search Eastman's Hunting TV on YouTube, uh, and it'll pop up all our videos there, uh, but constantly putting content on there. Uh, you can also check us out on the Outdoor Channel on Eastman's Hunting TV. Uh, I've got multiple episodes that are replaying on there uh, that I'm really proud of and some new ones that are yet to come out. Also, make sure to check out our magazines. Uh, we have a promo code. It's Elevated321, and that'll get you a subscription to both magazines, both the Eastman's Hunting Journal, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, uh, and it will get you an Outdoor Edge knife with free shipping, $50, or you can get one magazine and an Outdoor Edge knife for $30. Uh, it's a great deal. Uh, I just love the magazines, uh, the subscriber stories, uh, pro staff articles, and then the MRS section, which we talk about in this podcast, just has great information for understanding the West, uh, the tags that are available in each state's system. We also have an internet uh, a resource uh, 
uh, that's called Eastman's Tag Hub. So you'll hear us talk about it in this podcast, but it's basically a place where we've compiled all this information from the MRS and more. We're constantly adding to it and evolving it uh, to be the the greatest resource out west to be able to understand these systems, uh, tags available, and make you a more successful hunter. Again, that's called Eastman's Tag Hub. Uh, you can check that out. And with that, um, let's get into this podcast. So it's uh, Ike Eastman, Guy Eastman, Eastman's Elevated. I'm your host, Brian Barney. Here we go. Okay, I'm live here. I've got Ike Eastman and Guy Eastman on the podcast this morning. So uh, this is fun for me. So I want to get these guys on. There's so many uh, misconceptions in today's day and age about trophy hunting and and uh it seems like us hunters are on attack from from all sides uh from the media uh uh to other hunters and 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 then to non-hunters as well and so many of these non-hunters are help passing laws uh that go into effect that uh that 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 really uh you know have a have a real effect on the outcome of our, our biology and of our management of these game animals. So I thought you guys were the perfect guests to get on today. Uh, thanks a bunch for being on, Ike Guy. Yeah, I appreciate it, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, for sure. So um, you guys are probably hearing the same stuff from the media as I am, that, that trophy hunting is, is uh, evil and that, um, and, and that we're all just out there looking for the biggest critters and that we're not using the meat. Like, why, why are we put in this, in, in this box where um, is, is it just a way to attack us hunters? Because trophy hunting is a great way for conservation and, and trophy hunting is not evil. Like we are all using the meat and uh, uh, we're just setting our standards high, which is really good for the management of the animals. Why is it this way? Well, I think the biggest misconception to start with is, is the media and people who don't know, I'll call them the, you know, the ignorance out there that believe what the media set tells them. And the media, if you watch it, they can, they often, often, if you can watch six, that 60 minutes episode that they did on it, uh, all the way down to, you know, any of the mainstream media shows and, and uh, episodes that they've done. And they s- synonymously use trophy hunting and poaching interchangeably and that is not true a trophy if you i'll say the first thing i want to say brian if you go shoot an animal lop the head off and walk away from it you're not a trophy hunter you're a goddamn poacher and you need to be drug into a courtroom and have your hunting privileges taken away for the better part of a decade that is not trophy hunting that is poaching Every it's illegal in almost every state except Hawaii because they're in a different situation. They're on a eradication program, but with the exception of Hawaii and basically a few animals in Texas, that is illegal in every single state. Period. So you know, I think the main thing is when someone says something, you know, talks about uh, poaching or trophy hunting. Are they talking about poaching or are they talking about trophy hunting? Those are not the same things. You know, trophy hunting is conservation. Trophy hunting plays a very key role in management of our wildlife. You know, it, it everybody, you know, the, the meat is used whenever we kill, you know, hunt an animal, take it. You know, most people on TV see the racks, you know, on our backs and, and the meat's in there too, but you can't see it in your pack. You know, the cow hunter who's up there and shoots a cow, I mean, obviously he doesn't have antlers to pack out. And so, you know, you're not going to see it. It's the meat's inside the backpack. So, you know, we come across a fair amount on our TV show, mostly on the TV show. Because the magazine guys, you know, our magazine guys, they understand the concept. And probably a lot, most of your listeners, if not all of them, understand this as well. So we're talking to the people who either don't understand it or the people come across, you know, family members, relatives, people that come across that, that don't understand what we do and why we do it. So we're, we're, you know, we're here to explain it, but I just want to set that out right at the beginning. You know, if you're lopping heads off animals, leave them lay in the field, that that's poaching. That is not trophy hunting conservation or any part of hunting at all. Well, and it, and it actually in almost every state, um, it, it holds a higher, 
uh, penalty for leaving, it's called wanton waste of that animal, leaving that animal than if you shot it out of season without a tag, but you used the animal. Because, you know, most of these states are managing the wildlife uh, and the herds, but they understand that this is a substance uh, portion of, uh, you know, our society. Shane Mahoney uh, is a famed, he's a famed biologist, and he did a, he's doing a study on what would happen to North America if you took hunting out of our food procurement. And it is fascinating. Get online and search it, do some reading, watch a couple of his YouTube videos. It's fascinating uh, on how fast we would crater the, the, the ag industry if all of the wild game, uh, if you were no longer able to shoot wild game and eat it, it would, it's unbelievable. So it's, it's about food, for food procurement and about, you know, the wanton waste. That's poaching. Like Guy said, th there is no worse thing than leaving an animal later to rot. Um, it, is, it is the worst. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is just because you're, like Guy said, your listeners, we're kind of preaching to the choir. However, we all have that crazy mother-in-law or crazy sister-in-law or crazy whatever that doesn't understand it. What, I, what I'd like to do is just have a, a roundtable conversation of what are some bullet point talking points that we can use as hunters to put some logic and, and to uh, make those types, if they're rational people, most of the time they are, if they're rational people, some talking points to, to give, you know, your audience that when they're confronted with that crazy sister-in-law that, you know, they can say, hey, actually, it is, trophy hunting is conservation, and here's why. What, what, guy, what are some of the things that, that you know, you, you experienced and you know for a fact, being an expert in this, being around trophy hunting forever, some of the things that you would tell your crazy sister-in-law? Well, you know, trophy hunting is conservation. The money, the money for conservation comes from trophy hunting. I got news for you. The Game and Fish Department's not making tons of money off selling cow and doe tags. They make a little bit of money. But where they're bringing in the big money on the auction tags and all the conservation banquets and all that, that's all based on what people call trophy hunting. But first off, you know, trophy hunting is an integral part of management of the wildlife. You have to manage from both ends of that spectrum. You can't just manage the bucks or the bulls. You have to manage also the population sides, which is the cows. So everybody, the trophy hunters need the meat hunters. The meat hunters need the trophy hunters because the trophy hunters are what keeps the animals, the herd health in check. The game fish uses the, I call them trophy hunters, but that's the bull elk hunters, the buck deer hunters to keep that buck to doe ratio or bull to cow ratio in check you know and the cow hunters and the doe hunters they use that to keep the population down or reduce it so they they use both those factors and variables to keep the herd in check you know so and when you and i don't think people realize there's you're surrounded by trophy hunting if you eat crab meat guess what that's trophy hunting yeah. that's the reason we have a sustainable cat crab fishery in alaska because they have to keep the males of a certain size. They're the, keeping the older class males of the crabs, the rest they throw back in the ocean to keep breeding. So that, you know, that's one example. Fishing, Damn, right? Yeah. Brian, you know this, the slot limits. Most Western states now for trout have slot limits. We have them here in Wyoming where you can only keep fish under, I think it's 14 inches, you can keep six or one fish over 20, a trophy fish. They want those breeders, the 14 to 20 inches, to be thrown back in the river to survive. And that's how they've maintained a lot of these really fragile cutthroat trout fisheries. They're managing from both ends of the spectrum. They want less older animals, but they need to also reduce the smaller animals so they don't eat themselves out of house and home. That's what they do with cow or elk. They reduce the population size with the cow hunts. They keep the herd in check with the bull hunts. You know, when my dad was a young kid, this is an interesting story. When my dad was young, Jackson Hole had all these tourists coming in. They have the elk refuge there that everybody sees. They had this bright idea. Hey, you know, the elk aren't here in the summer. There's nothing for the tourists to look at. Let's build a pen and put a bunch of elk in there. 
for the tourists to look at. Okay, they're the federal government. They can do whatever they want. They built a high fence pen, put some elk in there. Guess what happened? All the bulls killed each other. The herd just, they, they, it was a complete failure because the bulls got old. The biggest bulls, the older bulls they put in there, they started competing during the rut and they killed each other, either killed each other or maimed each other to where they couldn't even breed and they killed all the younger ones in competition. You can imagine, Brian, you've been out there and seen how elk rut. You can imagine putting them in a 20 acre enclosure and see what happens. It was a disaster. They finally had to give it up and throw their hands up and walk away because they weren't able to keep that bull to cow ratio down. Now, if they had one bull in there with all those cows, that would have been fine. But they couldn't do that because they couldn't release the elk out of there because of bursalosis and a lot of other things. So they had to basically just keep them in there like a zoo. And it just was an epic, epic failure. What a disaster. Oh, man. Um, I'm so glad I got both of you guys on this morning to talk over trophy hunting because it is tough. Uh, like we, you know, it, it presents this opportunity for us to challenge ourselves as well. And it gives more opportunity to more guys to, to go after these older age class animals. But yeah, it's, it's, it's framed in a bad light a lot of times and it's tough to articulate, uh, uh, the conservations, but but you guys do such a good job uh, of explaining it or giving us talking points to it. And you know what a disaster pinning up the those elk so people could see them in Jackson Hole and having them kill each other off. But their populations have to be controlled, and and these older age class animals, like it's good for that herd health to take out these animals and let the 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 new young breeders come up and breed these animals. It it just creates a healthy population, and so yeah, it, it gets framed in this this bad light but it, it it's really important for the herd health to hunt these older age class animals so uh yeah you guys are just perfect and i know when um you guys are fired up about it like i i, I know it, it's gonna make for a good podcast and good talking points for these guys so um ike like um so so trophy hunting like why is um why did they throw this in with poaching like i hear so much about lions and like i just heard about a giraffe the other day and they really framed some of these animals in a in a negative light or like the grizzly bears in in bc um wh why did they choose some of these animals and then target these ones and lump us all together with these you know i on, i don't know why it is but society today has some sort of a fascination with predators, um, probably because it, they're, you know, they're dangerous and, and it's, <laughs> it reverts back to why people watch Freddy Krueger scary movies. They just like danger. It's some, you know, it triggers something inside their psyche. Uh, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but I did stay at the Holiday Inn Express one time and it, it just, we're fascinated with, with fear. You know, there's a, there's a reason why in all the old fables, Red Riding Hood, the Three Little Pigs, you can go down a line of them that the wolf is the villain. You know, there's a, there's, you know, it, it's in a fascination with pred predatory animals. And so if you look at most of the time, people are trying to protect those predators as if they need that. <laughs> uh, they don't. They've been existing in Northern Canada, Russia, all over the world, you know, Africa without, uh, without, protection and they're doing a really good job of it you know they need managed too though i mean if you if you look at what's ha what happens what's happening in the yellowstone ecosystem with the wolf um, without them when they weren't protected or where they weren't managing when the federal government and i'm here to tell you if you think they're not managing them you're on crack <laughs> you don't live here and not, don't spend enough time here a guy and i were at our parents house up in the uh, up right up on the border on Christmas or on New Year's Eve one day, and they had a helicopter flying around shooting wolves. And I just happened to know one know one of the wolf uh, trappers, and they shoot twenty to thirty wolves in on that day, just partially because you know the, the weather was good and they could fly, etc. But they're killing them. They have to to manage them. Otherwise, what happens is they get mange, they get disease, they get parvo, they get all these things. And can you imagine, I mean, would you rather be taken out quickly and, and swiftly, or would you rather die from mange over the a course of months up to a year? I mean, that's a horrible way to be, to, uh, be naturally maintained. 
So they have to be maintained. But, you know, the, the, the affection we have for predators is, is very unique, and it's changed over the last 10 years. I mean, when we were kids, the big bad wolf was a bad deal, man. We Nobody wanted to be Red Riding Hood. No one wanted to be... <laughs> Uh, no one wanted to be the, uh, you know, the three little pigs and have to deal with the wolf blowing your house down. That was that was hor- horrific as a child. So it's it's changed. But you know, one of the, one of the other talking points that on that that you know I I hear talking about. Well, why don't we just let the predators take care of the ungulates, you know, the the deer and the elk, and let them manage it? Why do we have to manage it? There's a lot of reasons. Number one, the predators. Um, you know, it's huge swings, ebbs and flows in those in those natural cycles, and they can eat themselves completely out of house and home, and then there's starvation and there's disease and all those things before the wolf population grows enough to where they can control it. We have the ability as humans, because we cognitive thinking, we can control that to where those ebbs and flows, those highs and lows in the population aren't so drastic. Number one. Number two, is you have the ability, we have the ability to manage that herd health. So a wolf may not have, may not be after a certain type of animal. They're after whatever's slowest, right? Whatever's sick, whatever's slowest, whatever they can get their hands on. And it's not, it's not necessarily the old and the weak. A lot of times we have footage on our YouTube video, our YouTube channel. We have footage of a lion taking down a mature breeding age class mule deer buck and that buck will never be able to to uh, pass its genes on and you know breed the 25 does or 30 does that it typically would because that lion ate it humans go well okay we're going to try and take the mature bucks the older class bucks the ones that are out of that that you know that breeding class to maintain her health. Plus we're going to take the weird ones, you know, the ones that are a little freaky that have one horn or have a growth on one side or whatever, so that that, that gene doesn't get passed on forever and ever as well. Um, so it's herd health. Yeah, absolutely. You bring up some good points there. Like, uh, the, those wolf populations. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, one of the only reasons our Valley was safe for it because the wolf populations decimated some herds, the, the, the Northern greater Yellowstone herd where they didn't shoot them out of the park and, and they attacked these elk that used to be 20,000 elk that would migrate out of the park is now down below 2000 with no tags. And this is a renewable resource. And so you bring up a good point about the ebbs and the flows of predator population and ungulate population, where if you let it go unchecked, it may take 50 years to recover from one of these ebbs or these flows, where if you can control them, uh, you can have a healthy, sustain- sustainable population population of both and so our valley was saved because these wolves can't help themselves uh they get down and get into these cattle ranches it's the cattle ranches have their calves they smell them they get down there they kill some calves and the cattle ranchers association has a lot of power and so when they get a couple calves that die they can call in the government trapper and even though the wolves are federally protected they go up and they thin the herd that's the only reason our elk population survived there's another story uh, like around elk city uh, some of the most remote country in the lower 48 where the wolves got in there same thing in that herd they took that herd from 18,000 uh uh, elk down to below a thousand in population and those those people don't see or get to hunt elk anymore because they let it got get out of hand and so their populations have to be controlled and then you look at bears they collared uh uh, some grizzly bears that were uh, up in Alaska up there. And then they, they they took account of how many caribou calves that they killed. But these bears, they can sniff out these calves when they're hiding them in the grass. And they kill something like 60% of the calves between the black bears and the grizzly bears. And that goes for elk calves, deer calves, caribou calves. And like, yep. like around in my area, these wolves... Um, you know, you think they kill all the sick and the weak, and they don't. They, they, um, you know, it's bred in them to kill. And I've been on scenes like when they first reintroduced these wolves, and there was a bunch of elk around. I'd go up to these scenes where they'd kill six, seven, eight elk, and they'd have their throats ripped out, and they didn't eat any of them. They were just fun killing these things, you know. And, and so they're a predator. That's what they're built for. 
they're they're made for it and they're an effective killing tool but their populations have to be controlled or it gets out of hand and we then we don't have this renewable resource of these ungulates to be able to hunt and procure meat year after year uh and have it recover and like um the moose populations have been devastated by the wolves because the 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 moose get in this deep snow and they can't move very fast and the wolves can run on top and so we've seen our moose populations um uh, go way downhill in these areas around montana and wyoming and idaho and so you know us guys that live out west we've seen the effect of these wolves but uh people are are so attached to these predators and they feel like they're their dog at their house and and so now we've seen new bills in colorado where they want to reintroduce them you know it's just crazy to me that that we can't get the truth out uh to the rest of the public you guy what do you think about those wolves um did you guys see the same thing there in wyoming uh your population survived where they could control them and then the populations that were close to the park uh those elk herds were decimated Oh yeah, we saw the same thing. Not a little bit different than you guys in Montana because we're we have a lot of really remote wilderness areas that you can't you know you can't get to other than on horseback surrounding the park. But yeah, the the, the elk populations dropped significantly when the first twenty years they had those wolves in there, and they've since kind of stabilized and actually come back in some areas. But like I said. It's because the federal government's controlling them. I mean, here's the thing that people don't understand. I'm talking to lay people who are not hunters, you know, just the average person walking down the street in Denver, Colorado, who just moved there from Brooklyn, New York. These animals will die. If it's not from hunters, it will be something else. It will be a black helicopter on New Year's Day or Super Bowl Sunday. We have seen it. You know, so when they say, oh, we're, we're, we're not going to hunt these uh, grizzly bears. Well, guess what? They're killing them. They're killing them other ways. They have to. They have to keep it in check because these animals will not just die. They will survive. And like your point, they're going to come down in the ag country. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the wolves aren't going to say, well, guys, you know, they're going to have a big meeting around a campfire and go, you know, I, we just use everything we kill like an you know, Plains Indians, we build teepees with the hides and the bones we use for needles and, and, uh, we eat everything we kill. We just ate everything. So we're just going to sit here and starve to death. Okay. Sorry guys. Game's over. We've run this train to the end of the tracks. No, they're going to move down, 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 down into the ag country, into the, you know, the, uh, suburban areas. And guess what? The slowest animal on the block might be your dog. Might be your kid. That's, that has been shown over and over and over again throughout the West when they put those wolves in here because they're very competitive with other canines and people. That is going to be the biggest disaster in Colorado. Everybody down there has a dog hiking up a trail and it is going to be mayhem when they put those wolves in there. Well, they already have them, but once they really take hold. But, you know, it's the moose, the Shiras moose is the true true endangered species out west and no one wants to talk about it they spent six hours in a helicopter do you know how much country you can cover in six hours in a bell jet ranger a lot they gridded off yellowstone guess what the moose count came back at at after six hours in a chopper zero Mm. not one moose not one when i was a kid you could see 20 30 moose going through yellowstone from jackson to cody not one. They have brought that population of Shiras moose down beyond return. They will have to do transplants to ever bring those moose back. Yeah, our best. And there is some other factors, disease and a few other things, but for the most part, it's predation. It started with predation. From bears, the bears and the moose. Or the bears and the, and the wolves. Well, and we're yeah, it started with we're... predation, putting, putting pressure on those moose, and then they couldn't recover or they couldn't sustain when the habitat, if it's disease or habitat dropped, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't fight all three fronts. And that's what happens. That's how you end up with zero moose in in one of the most pristine places in the lower 48. And you know what the, one of the biggest issues I want to talk about real quick while we're on this subject that I think a lot of people don't connect the dots on is wildlife displacement. Yeah. You guys have it a lot in Montana. 
And I don't, when they put those super predators in there, what happened is it displaced a lot of that wildlife. And I don't mean the elk went, oh, this is a scary place. There's wolves around every corner. I'm moving. But what happened is they naturally either killed off the elk up in the high country or the elk did move lower, never went back. And we're seeing it in Wyoming. And what happens is it's the California scenario. When they quit hunting mountain lions in California, all the deer are in town. Yeah. Now they have vast wildernesses with nothing in it. It's empty, vacant. And that's what's happened in Montana. A lot of the elk on public land in Montana have been taken out by the wolves by predation. And so now guess where most of the elk are? In non-traditional elk areas. Same with Wyoming, out in the desert units where there's private property, checkerboard, all these access problems they're facing. Oh my gosh, every, you know, there's tons of elk out in that field and we can't hunt. Where instead of the elk being where they're supposed to be, you know, up in the mountains above Ennis, and come maybe come down for the winter and go back up there. Now they're living down there, you know, in all this checkerboard country. And so you've got states now like Montana where you got 70% of the elk live on private property. People move there thinking they're living to move into an outdoorsman's paradise until they figure out that little, little tidbit. You know, the majority of our elk live on private property. So unless you bought a 20,000 acre ranch, you're just SOL, Bubba. You know, and then we're seeing it here in Wyoming, where most of our better elk areas now are out in the desert, arid country, yeah. which is fun to hunt if you have access. Because guess what's out there? Big cattle ranches, big private land holdings. So you go out there, you got to get your on X out, and you've got to figure out how to get here, how to get there. You know, creates a different game, but it creates a lot of frustration. And the game of fish is stuck in the middle, you know, between the landowners, the sportsmen, and trying to manage the wildlife. Yeah, well, and it, it doesn't make any sense that, that our biologists can manage all our ungulate populations and, and, and manage this resource, but then their hands get tied with, with wolves or their hands get tied with grizzly bears where they can no longer control the, the, the predator populations. And so you're right, like that's a great point, like moving these, these elk uh, to, to places where they wouldn't normally be, to habitats they wouldn't normally be, to be to to keep safe, and so yeah, I I just don't know why. Uh, they don't let the biologists control these. And just like the like the grizzly bears, we're seeing more human grizzly bear conflicts all over. Like it seems like there's multiple attacks in my valley every year, but yet the biologists that study this to keep healthy populations aren't able to control these grizzly numbers, you know? And the grizzly numbers are controlled by the, the feds, and they actually had, they voted to have a season that was reversed by the, uh, by the courts, you know, to start controlling these bears so we don't have so many of these conflicts. And so our, our ecosystem doesn't get out of balance. These grizzly bears kill so many moose calves and elk calves. And so to just let them go unchecked, it, 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 it makes an unbalanced ecosystem. So yeah, we, we need to put the control back in the hands of the biologists. And I am seeing more and more grizzly bears every single year. And in fact, uh, there was a young guy that I call him young cause he's the same age as me, but he was 40 and, um, he was fishing a hole <laughs> on the Madison going into West Yellowstone. And if you've ever crossed that bridge going into West, there's a good hole down the Madison before it dumps into Hebkin down along the first corner. And I've fished this hole a bunch. Like, I'll go up there and walk down there and go fish. It's really popular. Well, guy walked down there, and, and um, man, there was a, a, a grizzly bear that had killed a moose down there and was guarding that carcass and attacked him. You know, and he had bear spray and sprayed it, but ended up dying from his injuries. So we're going to see more of these these conflicts between, you know, wolves and people's dogs, uh, wolves and humans, I think we'll start to see, and, and grizzly bears and human conflict where, where nobody's going to be able to enjoy it. And these grizzly bears are getting, they're getting pushed down, just like Guy was stating, how when they run out of food, they don't sit up there with no food in the mountains. They come down to where the ungulates are. And so pretty soon now we're seeing them in river bottoms. And we're we're seeing them down in the prairies and down in in places where you wouldn't typically see these bears, which is just going to mean more conflict, which which is pretty scary to see. Um, Ike, you guys see? Uh, do you guys have grizzly bears around your area and down in the river? Getting more aggressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had we had uh, the last fall guy. We had uh, Sal and two cubs, and uh, they they dinned down along the river right now i mean we live in the middle of a valley ag farms and uh 
they again ran along the river. Now, thankfully, the, the game of fish were able to trap them before they went full hibernation. And uh, they were able to trap them, take them back up in the mountains and, and dump them off. But, you know, that's just going to become more and more as, as, as these bear populations um, get bigger and bigger, they push the younger bears out. I mean, it's, it, bears are bullies is all they are. <laughs> My dad calls them the North American monkey. They're just, they're just bullies. And so they have a territory. And so when an old sow has a territory, she pushes the young sows out of that area so that, you know, she, her habitat so she knows how to survive and where to get what, when. She pushes the young ones out, and so they start traveling. And then, and then you end up with a sow. You know, we're 70 miles from, from any sort of forest service. And here's a bear, a grizzly bear and her two cubs, you know, dinned up along the river. That would be a surprise for a guy out there irrigating his cornfield. Come A bear come flying out of there and, and uh, attack him and, and his kids and whatever else. I mean, it's. It's becoming a problem. The other thing that I want to discuss here, and, and I don't know the statistics. I should have looked them up before we talked about this. Maybe Guy does. But they, they just, uh, the federal government just released a new strategy on counting the bears. So they kind of re-engineered the formula a little bit because of better technology and better understanding. And it now it came out that they, they believe there's two or three times more bears than they thought there were, Guy. It's it's significant. Three times. It's off by a factor of three, maybe more, the way they were counting. Of course, they were fudging the counts, you know. Well, we want to protect these bears, so we're going to suppress the counts, how we do it, to bring those numbers down to make it look like there's less bears. Well, they've been in so many court battles. Finally, a judge questioned how they were doing the count, and when they made them like actually do a count like they do a, a standard procedure for any other wildlife count, it came back as three or four times the number. Which that's huge considering, you know, they only wanted 700 bears and now they have 2,100 bears. That's, that's a completely different number. That's a lot of bears. Yeah. And I think that's what we're seeing with the bear conflicts with humans. They're becoming more aggressive, yeah. you know, as, it's just natural. It's the natural way of things. People just think they can change the world as it's been for millennia by doing some, tweaking some numbers and doing their voodoo magic on it. And they can't. The animals are animals. Bears are bears. Uh, wolves are wolves. When those prey populations come down, which they are, the bears have to get more aggressive. And that's why we're seeing people get killed by these bears now. That didn't used to happen. I ran the statistics, you know, a long time ago, and it was very rare for you to actually die from a bear attack. You know, you'd get roughed up. They'd rough you up, roll you around, bite on you. You know, they're trying to teach you a lesson, a bully, you know, don't come in my territory. Now, they're starving. They're hungry. They have to protect everything, like that bear on that moose. That moose, there are no more moose left. He found probably one of the only moose in your valley, Brian, and he was good. she was going to protect it with her life or that guy's life, you know, instead of just roughing him up and moving on. You know, she, she had no choice, and she took she she went after, after the guy and killed him. And now we're seeing people actually drug out of tents, killed by bears, and, and things we never hardly used to see at all, you know, a decade ago. Yeah. yeah, and again, they're being displaced and having to get more aggressive. And the wolves will do the same thing. Now they won't probably start attacking people, but taking people's dogs out, you know, someone's goat, you know, you know things around the ranch down in town. I mean, it, it's gonna it's gonna get bad as they let this get out of control. And the federal government knows this, and the game fish know this. They're not going to talk about it public. They're not going to release uh, press releases and public statements. But that's why they're flying their black helicopters around on the weekends and holidays, because they know this is going to a very bad place. And Colorado, it's headed your way. Oh, yep. man. Uh, yeah, and that, you know, to... Colorado, it, it... Go ahead, Ike. Oh, I was going to say, Colorado's prime for, for wolves, because they, the way that that country's built, there's a reason why there weren't wolves there. Partially because there wasn't the habitat in the game. Well, we've we fixed that little problem with the help of the Elf Foundation and others. The wolves, that country is prime for wolves. It's going to be a mess. Oh, it will be. But, you know, back, uh, we'll loop back to where we started on this. 
the American hunter and outdoorsman is the most powerful force in wildlife management ever created on Earth. And I should say the North American right. hunter, because it was Mexico and Canada as well that came up with what we now know as the North American model of wildlife conservation and management. And it's been rolled out globally places i've traveled to that you can't believe the conservation success stories mm -hmm. that are you know out there all over the planet whether you're in asia africa you know they, they've taken a lot of new zealand a lot of what we have done here and and taken it globally and part of that is like we said predator control and the other part is wildlife management through hunting, and that when you get into that facet, you have to control, you have to manage the overall population as well as the herd health, which is where the trophy hunters come into to uh, the equation. Yeah, well, and that wildlife yeah, and conservation our, our... model is like um, it it it's this model that allows all of us to to be able to hunt these these lands and have this opportunity. It it's just awesome where it's not uh, uh it's not just the wealthy that get to go do it. Like every American has the opportunity to get a hunting license and go out and procure their own meat, and it's the best uh, uh nutrient dense organic protein. Uh, not pumped full full of hormones. Not pumped full of pump full of anything and they get to live wild and free out and graze on these grasses and, and then we're able to harvest them and it's this renewable resource that comes back each and every year and the the to be able to have this the, this thing that's available to all of us that's a renewable resource and to be able to go out and target uh these larger older age class males like this is what gets us excited like chasing a, a big bull with a giant rack or a uh you know a, a buck with a giant rack like that's what what we dream about and and uh i love the meat and i it keeps me and my family uh, uh, healthy all year long that's about all we eat is wild game and, and i absolutely love it but i love the challenge of being able to target a four or five year old mule deer, a six year old mule deer, one past its breeding prime at seven or eight. Like the challenge of that, they become a different species. They come become uh, way smarter, way craftier, way wiser. Like they're 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 almost a different species altogether when they get old. They're so tough to harvest one of these older age class trophies that I like setting my sights on it. And I found that these trophy animals eat as good as the young ones, you know? And so I love the meat, but I also love the challenge and I love the opportunity to go out and, and challenge myself both mentally and physically and, and put this, the, the, this, this high uh, degree of difficulty on myself to try to harvest one of these older age class. And, and uh, I, I just, um, this conservation model is unlike anywhere else. And I think um, we need to fight to protect it for sure. Uh, especially on, as we're on attack from, from all sides and especially from, uh, from some sources of the media, you know, is that having you guys on this podcast and having each one of the listeners be able to talk to their family intelligently or talk to that sister-in-law, like Ike stated, and be able to give them the facts about what we have and why it's so important to protect that. Uh, I think that's our job as sportsmen. And, and I think, you know, we all need to work hard at that to, to reflect it in a positive light because it is a, it's a beautiful thing. And I know, you know, each and every one of us love to take part in it, in it each and every season, you know, so uh, we have to fight hard to protect it because we are under attack. And um, just like Ike stated, like uh, in Colorado, man, they are going to have a, a mess on their hands there as we built these huge populations that these, these wolves are going to decimate, you know, they're going to go in uncontrolled and uh, 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 be able to, to, to wreak havoc on these animals. They have to be kept in check. And so, uh, it, it's why I think it's so important that we reflect a trophy hunting in a positive light and not let them attack us from that side. So, Ike, what do you think some of the talking points are that we can take uh, with people that aren't hunters, that, that that we can try to explain this, that that trophy hunting isn't a bad thing, that it is important for this population, and that it is necessary, and that these are these are good people that are using all this meat. Uh, what What are some of the talking points that you'd take on that? Number one is that if you're, if the first thing is trophy hunting is conservation, period. It is about herd management, period. That's it. And trophy hunting is you're procuring meat 
If you aren't, you're poaching, and you need to be thrown in jail for that. Number two is we, the conservation is being funded not by these these uh, groups that are say they're for friends of the wildlife. They're not. Those groups aren't funding wildlife at all. None of it. In fact, they're funding agendas is what they're doing. The money that that our federal government and our states get not only from license sales but also from every time you buy bullets, every time you buy a weapon, it's called the Pittman-Robertson Act. And every single one of those purchases, there's a tax on that. And that tax goes into, into the funding, the conservation of the wildlife. Let's, let's say you outlaw, let's just talk a couple talking points. Let's say you outlaw guns. You know what that does to wildlife? They're, they're unfunded. They're defunded. <laughs> defunded and disappear. Let's say you, you uh, get rid of hunting except for food procurement. Guess what happens? Your herds become unhealthy and they die of disease. Let's, I mean, you could go down the list of things that I don't remember how much. Guy, do you remember how, much, how big the Pitt and Robertson Fund is every year? It's billions of dollars, like $70 billion or some crazy number. And the states get, get, those, get that chunked to them by the federal government. It's a federal tax. The states get it per how, what their wildlife management strategy is, right? Yeah, I think it's it's a calculation. It's pretty complicated, but some of it depends on how many outdoor hunters they actually have, outdoorsmen. But yeah, it's it's apportioned per state by a calculation. But some states, the Pittman Robertson money that comes back to them from the federal government is larger than their actual budget. Now they have to use it on conservation on certain projects. They can't buy new trucks and and stuff with it they actually have to you know use it for certain things right. but ike's right it's it's massive that amount, amount of money is absolutely massive it eclipses any of these green groups that talk that are funding fundraising is basically what they're doing by scaring old ladies into thinking that they, that all the animals are going to die from you know from poachers right and yeah the, uh, yeah which they call trophy hunters and the, and the money that that is funding federal wildlife is not, it's not tax money. It's not, it's not money that you, if you're not a hunter, are paying in on your income tax. That's not where it's coming from. It's coming from, it's self-funding is what it is. It's one of the only things in the U.S. that is self-funded. Uh, Wyoming uh, Game and Fish is self-funded, and I think we're one of two, maybe three states that are, that we are self-funded, meaning the only funds they get are the ones that they collect from uh, licenses and and those types of things, and then the Pittman Roberts, they're you know their chunk of the Pittman Roberts, um, but, but that's a huge money. And the other thing I want to talk about real quick, and a lot of people don't understand this. I had this conversation this weekend. When the, one of these nonprofit organizations, let's say, let's talk about the Bears, they sued right before the season for the grizzly bears in Wyoming and, and Montana, they sued the federal government. These, non, these nonprofit organizations sued the federal government and used, you know, drummed up some crazy science that the science behind hunting them is not accurate, blah, blah, blah. What people don't understand is those organizations aren't, they don't have to put, pony up the money for the lawsuit. There's a, uh, an act, a federal act, that if you're a nonprofit and you are suing the federal government or the state agencies, for that matter, you get your, your uh, attorney's fees refunded to you from that organization, be it the federal government or the state, state. Because, I mean, I understand the logic because you can't, you know, can you imagine trying to battle the federal government with unlimited funds? They just print more money and pay more lawyers. I understand it. However, your money is not going to defend that. If you if you're putting money in into a nonprofit and they sue the federal government, that's the nonprofit gets refunded for those those fees. So that's why those nonprofits, I consider them sue happy. There's no risk for them. None. They don't have to pay the money. They don't have to go get money from their constituents to pay for those for those uh, those lawsuits. They're getting it refunded back to them. Man, that is wild. Yeah, I had no idea, and I think a, a lot of us don't have any idea uh, that they get refunded uh, because of that. 
that that is a major problem and a major flaw in the system that they're able to tie it up that way um Man, oh man, like um, that grizzly bear season, the, the guy already had his tag in Wyoming. He had already drawn it. He was ready to go on his hunt when they shut it down, you know, by suing the, the federal government. And they take it, they know all the ins and outs to take it to the right courts too, you know. And um, they took it to the right court and they got it shut down. And so now we're seeing more bear human conflicts and more people dying. And, you know, I, I talked, I've had Cole Kramer on the podcast, who is a legendary brown bear guy that, that, guides on on Kodiak Alaska and uh, guides for some huge brown bears I mean we're talking uh, 10 foot and, uh, and over 1500 pound bears and talking to him on the podcast he's more afraid of our grizzly bears that we have here in the states than those Kodiak brown bears he said your guys's bears are gnarly in Wyoming Montana and Idaho because they have no fear they've never been hunted all they know is that they can get into to camps or they can uh, 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 they, they have no healthy fear of humans and so so talking to Cole Kramer, he's more afraid of our bears that that we have, our inland state uh, grizzly bears, than he is those those Kodiak brown bears. So, uh, yeah, we definitely need to change the perception. But it's about us being able to explain these talking points to the non-hunters because a lot of these non-hunters are the ones that are voting. And we've seen that in British Columbia where they shut down the grizzly bear hunting uh, by these huge populations in the cities that are voting uh, that, that never have to deal with the grizzly bears or the grizzly bear uh, human conflicts, but yet they're voting to take away trophy hunting for these bears and and they didn't do a good job. Uh, the hunters didn't do a good job or they tried, but they weren't able to get the job done to explain these to the to the voting public. And, and I think that's important is that we need to uh, be intelligent with our approach and be able to articulate and explain you know why we need hunting and why we need this this conservation and why it's so important like uh you go in the park like i talked to somebody that went in the park the other day they didn't see an elk and they were there at first light like all they saw was a handful of bison in there the the the, the bears and the wolves have decimated that population in the park because they don't have that conservation model there in the park they don't touch it they don't do anything with it and so those wolves they they've killed all those elk and they'll you know, I've heard the media try to spin it and say, well, the aspen trees are coming back, that this was good for the park. Well, people don't pay to go look at aspen <laughs> trees in the park. You know, they're going to see elk and, and uh, bison and see these healthy, healthy populations. And as those, as those wolves decimated those populations, they started spreading out to these other states. And that's where we saw it, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana. And as Guy stated, we are seeing a great recovery because we're able to trap them, because we're able to hunt them, because we're able to control those populations where the first 10 years when it went unchecked it was pretty scary around here i wasn't sure we were going to have elk left to hunt or i wasn't sure my kids were going to be able to hunt elk and experience that and thank goodness we got that passed and hopefully we can continue passing these laws to control these populations but uh, a lot of it is the the media perception and i i just see it all the time how they try to spin it uh, to, to make their points and to make their angles. Uh, it just drives me nuts. Uh, guy, it's got to drive you nuts, like seeing this media and the way they spin things. <laughs> I try not to pay attention to it, but it, it is, it is over the top, you know, and, and I think it, it, in their world, back to Ike's point, it equates to dollars. The more they scare people, these, you know, non-hunting anti-hunting groups the more they scare people the more money they raise and the more money they raise the more ads they buy the more they buy the media the more they get to dictate their narrative because guess what they ain't paying for the lawyers right we all are we're all paying for their lawyers and so it's just, it's like a it's a, a self self-sustaining disaster that just gets bigger and bigger because their money all goes back to more fundraising to more, you know, more uh, media buys, to more pushing the media to to go along with their narrative, because that all that lawyer stuff is paid for by the government. The government's paying to sue itself, basically, and, and then it gets just stuck in a gridlock, and and it's a giant mess. And people don't understand, you know, how all the pieces in that fit together to create what sound wildlife management. You know, in Wyoming, we had wolf hunting for a while. And then they shut it down for like four or five years while they fought it out in court. 
it's very interesting because I studied the numbers one time when I was doing a, a write up for the magazine. The, when they shut it down, it, it, of course, the wolves weren't being hunted, but they were still killing the wolves, like I said, out of helicopters. You know, the government, governments, the state and the, and the federal government were still killing the wolves even when it was shut down because they had to, and the ranchers because they would get permits right. when they come into their, their uh, fields and stuff. And then they opened it back up. It finally got sorted out, opened back up. Guess what? They actually killed more wolves when it was shut down than they do now when it's open to hunting. Because guess what? The wolves change their behavior. And like back to Cole Kramer's point, they know they're hunted, so they stay up where they're supposed to be, up in the mountains, and don't come down into the fields as much as they used to. Yeah. So, you know, it does change the behavior of these animals, and the grizzly bears would have been no different. You want less grizzly bears killed? Yeah, open it up to hunters. Mr. Joe Blow from Montana, or a lady from California, I mean, you want less grizzly bears killed? Open it to hunting. Guarantee if they opened it and had open, left it open for hunting, they would be killing less grizzly bears now than they are the state and federal government is. Number one, hunters can't use the same, you know, they're not, they're not doing it out of a black helicopter. Number two, they're not, you know, using the equipment that, that, that the federal government has access to. And number three, every time one of those state agency guys have to pull the trigger on a bear or a wolf, it's money out of their pocket. So they're not, you know, a, a bear tag, those were five grand if you drew that. That's a lot of money. If you shoot 25 bears in, a, in the Yellowstone ecosystem, which isn't even, it, you know, it's, it's not even 1% of the bears, which is a zero effect on on the population, zero effect on the population. That's a lot of money. That's a, that's a ton of money out of their out of their pocket that can be used for new trucks and you know salaries for the game uh, biologist and that stuff. Yeah, and I think um, you know to to do our and less bears killed. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think um, you know, I think our job as sportsmen is to try to 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 speak positively about it, uh, to reflect it in a positive light, you know, whether that's social media and to take part in it, take part of this this great resource that we have here, you know. And so, you know, part of that um, is being able to go out and have these positive experiences. And, and there's opportunities all across the West. And there's opportunities for rifle guys, for muzzleloader, for archery. And, and, and I know... You know, taking part of this this conservation model is so important and then reflecting it in a positive light. But, you know, being able to go out and have these experiences and then share these experiences with your kids and share these experiences with your friends. But, you know, it takes a lot of work and, and it takes a lot of work. Like to be a trophy hunter, you have to be the most elite hunter out there. You have to build a skill set that's so strong to be able to go in these places and, and and to try to expect to give yourself a chance at this success. And so, uh, like, we at Eastman's have worked so hard at this new uh, internet research tool that we came out with, this Tag Hub. Uh, and, and this tool, like, I got to tell you guys, like, like over the last – uh, uh, 10, 15 years that I've been hunting out of state and going on all these adventures. I've used the back of the magazine, the the MRS section, and and guys been in charge of this and put a ton of work into this. And now we've got a place where we've compiled all this data in our internet research tool. Uh, this is so handy for guys to be able to use this and be able to find the right tags, the right opportunities to understand all these these state agency systems and how they work and be able to apply for these tags and go enjoy these adventures. So um, I know you guys have worked really hard on this on this tag hub, and I think it's such a great resource for guys to learn about these different states and different units. Uh, what are some of the other points to this tag hub? Some of uh, like I'm always impressed when I hear all the the data points that we have and all the information. Uh, what do we have in tag hub and what's coming next? Maybe Ike, you can talk about it a bit. Yeah, um, one of one of the things is it's a it's a great place to be keep informed. You know, uh, we talked about how the media is spinning, you know, and and using trophy hunting and poaching synonymously it tag hub at least to give you some information that is accurate uh we come out with blogs every week that 
uh, talk about predators, talk about, you know, what's going on with fires, what's going on with, with uh, migration patterns, whatever. I mean, there's, there's a ton of information in there that is exclusive to Tag Hub. There's uh, video content that, you know, we release video content in Tag Hub before we release it anywhere else. If you want to watch the latest and greatest of whatever whatever hunt, you know the guys here in the office, guy and I, Dan, all those, all Brian, your stuff, uh, get on Tag Hub. You get to watch it first. Uh, there's a ton of of content in there that is, um, you know, books, um, all of da- of guy and I father's elk hunting books, and you know, elk hunting 101, and all these things that are resources that if you're trying to just sharpen and hone your skills and do it, uh, you know, take your hunting to the next level, uh, There's those books are in there. If you're a subscriber, you get those books for free. Um, plus, you know, there's a ton of other benefits, and, it, and it, it's going to evolve. We're working on, you know, the next step, which is mobile-friendly and, and integrating more apps or more maps into the system and being able to do that mobily. I mean, there's a ton of things coming down the pipe as we um, – as we see the need and guys are wanting so that there's kind of a one-stop shop for everything you need as a, as a Western hunter and not just trophy hunting, but if you're a beginner, you still, guy just was telling me yesterday that he did all the elk and deer, uh, uh, doe tags in Wyoming and they load, they're going to load that on, on tag hub. So if you're, if you're a trophy hunter and you go, well, you know, I didn't see anything that, that I was tickled pink to, to harvest in, the, in my trophy area. I'm going to go get a cow tag or next year I'm going to get a cow tag guy has that information in there. So, you know, at least where you can get cow tags as well as your trophy tag, or if you're a beginner in the world and say, Hey, I'm just learning how to hunt. Here's the information that you want to know how to, how to start your game because out West it is a game, everything from drawn tags to, to uh, all the way to the kill and getting it out. And all that information is in tag hub. Everything you'd need to know. You can drown yourself in information or you can go right to the source and say, okay, I'm going to open up Mike Eastman's book and I want to figure out how to, how to, I, I shot two bulls, you know, one was a spike and one was a, a four point. Now I want to take it to the next level. Open up Mike Eastman's book and talk about the different classes and the different age groups and how to take that next step. All the way to, if you're a trophy hunter, you've been doing it for 50 years. There's, you can always learn something. Things are changing constantly, and somebody stumbled across something that you might be able to hone your skills better. Yeah, there's so much value there. And I saw that we're also giving away subscriptions to the magazines with that Tag Hub. Uh, so when you get the Tag Hub, you also yep. get the Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, Eastman's Hunting Journal, which has been my favorite magazine for years. Like I used to run to the mailbox when they'd show up. Uh, so, so you get that. We're also doing <laughs> hunt giveaways. Uh, we partnered with sponsors to do giveaways. Uh, there, there's going to be some awesome hunts that we give away that guys go on this year. Uh, so, so many benefits. And, and then again, it's, it's reflecting, uh, hunting in a positive light, like, uh, uh, sharing your stories with the magazines and having that published through the magazine, you know, for our subscriber stories. Uh, it, it's reflecting it in a positive light, you know, all the, the, the pictures are, are so classy in there uh, where we don't show a lot of blood or we don't show, you know, somebody sitting on the animal or in the back of their truck is, uh, you know, we frame it up and, right. and show a really tasteful picture in there. And then uh, hunters are able to tell their stories and submit their stories and then, um, you know, share that with their family and friends. So uh, it's just such a great deal and, and uh, uh, so fun to be part of. Uh, Guy, you have worked so hard on all this information over the years, compiling this information. It has to be fun to see it come to light, like in an internet research tool that's really handy for guys to use. And it's got to be fun to see it grow as well. Yeah, it's it's been been crazy. Uh, of course, I I just do Wyoming and kind of oversee some of the other stuff, uh, thirty thousand foot level. So there's a lot of guys behind the scenes that put this together. It's not just me, of course, but it it's just a mountain of data and information to handle and just to see it online. Uh, I'm not a tech guy, so there's a lot of it I don't understand when they talk about the uh, the stuff around the office here. I just purely dive into the data or work on the data itself but uh, it is an interesting new uh, new mo- new world with with all this digital 
digital world we live in now. And like Ike said, you know, he did a great job explaining all the things that are on there. We're adding to it more and more every day to where we're going to, you know, build a, a hunting community on there that's based around trophy hunting because that's what we are. That's our core of our business. But also, like I said, we're adding in some of the antlerless uh, elk and I just put in the antlerless uh, moose hunts in Wyoming because, you know, I, you know, not everybody's a trophy hunter all the time. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a lot of guys say, ah, oh, you know, I can't draw an elk tag or I'm waiting to draw my bull tag. I'm going to go hunt cows or, or uh, you know, an antlerless hunt for meat. And that, you know, so we're adding all that information so guys can understand where they can do that, what those draws are, or where they can get a second choice uh, cow tag uh, on their application and whatnot. So it just, it, it fits for a broader audience and, and is just building a need more for, for guys who want to want to do that as well. Well, and a lot of over the counter opportunities. You bring up a, a... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so... guy, you bring up a good point. I, I I forgot to mention this about trophy hunting photos. Um, one of the one of the things that uh, I hear, you know, the crazy sister in law ask is, "Well, you guys are you know you're killing stuff and you're just taking a photo, a trophy photo with with, with the head and." It's all about the head. It's all about the head because that's, you know, that's, that's their narrative. That's what they see is the, is the trope. We call it grip and grins or trophy photo. And I have to remind guys, listen, this is, you know, we're sitting right here in the middle of the Olympics, right? Do they get, do the Olympians, the, the bronze, the silver, the gold, do they get put on, put on a pedestal? Absolutely. Because they've accomplished something. They've taken it to the next level and accomplished something. No different then if I went in the back country and I took a bull, a good mature bull, and I, I want to take a photo of that for various reasons. Number one, we all have an ego. It's a little bragging right? You know, there's no photo. It's, they say in fishing, no photo, it didn't happen, right? Those are just fishing stories. So there's a photo. Number number two is I want to be able to sit on, on my in my lazy boy when I'm old and, and decrepit and I can't get in the hills anymore, and I want to see those photos. I want to clip through those photos via an album or apparently digital now, and clip through those, and it brings me right back to that hunt, right back to to how it, you know how that stock went down, or I had 20 stocks below before that that I that completely blew them up, and that one worked. It, finally, I got the stars to align, and it worked. And all those emotions and all, you know, then the work began and the four trips out of the back country with that, those hundred pound backpacks on, you know, all of that comes rushing back from one photo. A photo is a thousand words. And I think in, in our world with back country hunting and all that stuff, I, I think it's more than a thousand words. Cause I couldn't describe, of course, I'm not very good at it, but I couldn't describe in a thousand words, the emotion that I felt as, as I would if, by looking at that trophy photo. So trophy photos aren't evil. They're actually a remembrance. A, a, a time stamp of what happened, what occurred. Uh, we used to have a camera guy that said this all the time. Uh, he, you know, he'd, he'd start rolling film in a hunt. He'd go, okay, tell me what, or he would say, people want to know what's happening. And that's what it is. People want to remember what happened. Oh, absolutely. That's as, as much of a trophy to me as, as the, uh, uh, as keeping the horns or any of that is that trophy photo. Cause you're right. It takes you back to that place and that hunt you were on and, uh, it takes you back to those feelings. And, and it's not easy to be a Western hunter success odds run anywhere, you know, from five to 20% with the bow in most units and, and, and maybe as much as 40 or 50% more premium units or some of these rifle hunts. But, uh, the, the deal is, is it isn't easy and it takes a bunch of work and it, 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 it takes constantly improving and evolving your skills to get better at this game to where you can expect to have success out there. And so uh, like these tools like like Tag Hub, diving into the research and diving into these tags and the opportunities that are out there. This is a, uh, uh, an ever evolving or ever learning uh, learning curve like uh, this Western hunting, like being able to get into it. If you're not continuing to learn and continuing to gain information, you're following you're following behind you know so it's so important to keep gathering this inf information to get good trophy photos and and to go take part in this um the the, w the western conservation you know to go take part and buy these licenses and to buy this hunting gear um yeah. 
where our tax dollars go towards um, uh, protecting what we all love to do, you know, this um, the the wild west or the you know the the wild lower forty eight or you know the the whole North America for that matter. So um, it's it's just awesome to be part of and to be part of such a great company that gets it. And you guys were the perfect guest today to describe trophy hunting. So uh, thanks a bunch. Closing thoughts, Ike. Uh, just get out there, you know, enjoy it, enjoy the time, take your family, you know, take somebody along that has never hunted with, you know, take the crazy sister-in-law, maybe, maybe she, she get addicted to it. Uh, take your kids and uh, be a mentor to somebody because we all had to learn from someone. Yeah. Closing thoughts, guy. Yeah, I agree with Ike, you know, get out there and do it. More, more hunters. We need more hunters out there and we need to stick together. I know it's easy to sit here and nitpick at each other and all oh, the, the meat hunters don't like the trophy hunters and the trophy hunters don't like the meat hunters. And I don't like the non-residents in my hunting spot, <laughs> but we all play a part. Every single one of us plays a part. A reason my elk tag in Wyoming is only $54 is because Brian Barney came down here and spent $1,100 for his <laughs> elk tag. Okay? You know, the kid who shoots a fork and horn, he's playing his part too. That's a new hunter minted into the system, you know? And, and the, you know, the cow hunters, they need us uh, trophy hunters to shoot the the uh, older bulls because we're managing the health of the herd and our success rates are very low. So Brian Barney's contributing a lot of money. Guy Eastman's contributing a lot of money on tags that I don't even fill, you know? And so that's money into the system without a take out of the system. So everybody plays a part. It's easy to point fingers. When you walk into someone's trophy room, don't see a bunch of glass eyes and dead death on the wall. That's somebody's life's work of memories in the field with his friends and family. Every one of those trophies has a memory to him, even though it doesn't mean anything to you. And people who aren't hunters don't get that. But those of us who are, we understand that. The meat on these antelope is long gone, but the the, anim, the head on the wall there is a memory of... of uh, a hunt and experience in the field, which is worth more than a thousand words and is, is a lifetime achievement for, for a lot of us. Very well said guys. Well said. Very well said. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thanks Brian. Yep. Thank you guys. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Uh, always a fun conversation when I get to sit down with, uh, Ike and Guy Eastman. They're just so well informed and, tapped into Western hunting as it's been in their family for years. And it's so important that we can explain our position as hunters. Uh, you know, a lot of these non-hunters are voting for our hunting regulations. And so uh, we need to be able to explain our, our position intelligently. And uh, these guys do a great job, brought up some great points on how to explain trophy hunting to people as, you know, it's it's what we all love to do. And sometimes I struggle with explaining that and uh, uh, explaining the, the positives in the conservation side of things. So uh, thanks to those guys for coming on. I also want to thank our sponsors for today's show, Sportsman's Warehouse and Savage Rifles. Uh, just uh, uh, great companies with great products. So if you're in the market for anything, make sure to check those guys out. Also, make sure to check out uh, Eastman's. We mentioned the Tag Hub in there, Internet Research Tool. Uh, both magazines, we've got that promo code ELEVATED321. Uh, that'll get you both magazines, $50 and an outdoor edge knife. Um, so with that, uh, I'm back in town here for a couple weeks trying to get some work done and um, had a great hunt, great adventure. I'll um, release a podcast on that. I did record a, a live podcast, so I'll check the audio on that, get that out to you guys. Um, but yeah, just a great high country hunt, a grind of a hunt, um, but just the way I like it. So, um, had an absolute blast. I'll be releasing that to you guys and I uh, got some good ones coming up. Uh, I think I want to release this one. Um, I did one with Robbie Denning that's just amazing on mule deer. Uh, so we'll get that one out to you guys recorded a good one last night. So, uh, just some great recordings for hunting season as you guys are traveling around and doing these hunts, uh, to hopefully be able to, to educate and entertain you guys and get you that information, uh, that helps make you successful out West. So, uh, thanks for all the support. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening in on the podcast. And with that, I'll check in with you next week.